Hello everyone, welcome to International University of the East Home Meditation Center, Los Angeles. Here we are with the Buddhist Thought and Philosophy course, BMN 608, which is a four credit class in the fall 2020. My name is Venerable Sumita or Bhante Sumita, and I am the instructor of this course. So far, we have done week one, two, week three, week four, five, and then week six. Last week, we had the mid semester examination. And we do have just a few more weeks to go. Today is week seven, the spread of Buddhist thought and philosophy along the Silk Road to Central and East Asia. Uh, we will cover up today part one. And then we just have a few more weeks before the couple of weeks, in fact, before our final examination. So according to today's lesson plan, um, I want to just recap, quick recap with you with week one assignment, uh, week two activities, week three activities, week four activities, and then week five, six, um, and then uh, we had uh, midterm examination last week and again week seven assignments. So I want to congratulate all the students who completed, successfully completed all the assignments according to the, the assignment plan that I have given. And I also uh, strongly recommend you complete the, the chart that I shared in the Google Drive folder so that you know exactly what you have completed so far. If any of you have not done that, and uh, please remember, unless and until you finish all those assignments and uh, according to that plan, uh, and also um, if you have not done the uh, mid semester examination or the optional paper writing, and also the, the final uh, presentation uh, and examination, um, you won't be able to successfully complete this course. And I, uh, I also strongly recommended um, you that uh, you may join our meditation program in the weekend so that you know we can you can also get some uh, extra credit uh, for missing classes or whatever. But uh, it's, yeah, it's up to you. So hopefully you have uh, completed or if not, you must have been um, working on your assignment. And I wish you all the very best. And I wish you all um, get the best of health and spirit so that you can successfully complete this course um, at the end of uh, this semester. So assignments for the week seven, I would like to start with that, write a short essay on Buddhism through Silk Route. And uh, you can also check all the, uh, the study materials that I have provided in the Google Drive folder uh, for, as uh, resources for this writing. And then another assignment would be watch this video and write a summary, spread of Buddhism along the Silk Road. And the link also is available in the Google Drive. And then uh, there's another assignment here, watch this video and leave a comment or question in the comment section of the video. And then again, the link is available in the Google Drive. 
So under the Sutta study series that I conduct every Friday, live through uh, Dhamma USA YouTube channel, uh, we have been discussing Majjhima Nikaya, the Middle End sayings. There are 152 suttas, and we started from Sutta number one, and uh, this would be Sutta number three, the Dhammadaya the Sutta. So I recommend you watch that with that video as well. Uh, one, uh, you get um, you enhance yourself uh, in the the Dhamma and uh, the the teaching of the Buddha. And if you have any question, you can leave some comment in the comment section. And then, uh, as I mentioned uh, here again, uh, join the guided meditation on every Saturday at six a.m. through Dhamma USA YouTube channel which will be uh, very uh, useful for those people who could not complete uh, or attended uh, the, the classes um, live. Or uh, if you have missed uh, any of the classes, uh, that joining this meditation will also give some um, extra credit for you. And so you have to make sure that you attend and depends on how you uh, react to those uh, videos and not just how very good, but you have to really talk about some content and maybe also ask some questions about that, which will be very useful uh, to you uh, as well. So that would be uh, the other assignment, number four. Okay, so lesson four, week seven, Buddhist thought and philosophy. We will have this topic today, the spread of Buddhist thought and philosophy along the land Silk Route to Central and East Asia. Okay, so in this uh, particular case, it will be important to talk about uh, uh, some of those details. During the first and second centuries after the passing away of the Buddha, uh, Buddhism could uh, hardly be distinguished from other ascetic uh, movements. So during the, the Maurya period, uh, Buddhism emerged as very special uh, religion with great potentials uh, for expansion. And um, especially uh, thanks to um, thanks to some of those great kings who patronized uh, Buddhism in many different ways, uh, Buddhism could uh, reach out to um, every nook and corner of the world. Although sometimes it is it is evident that Buddhism lost its, lost its ground in the the land of its birth due to many reasons again. And then Buddhism still could reach out to many other countries. And those countries um, very powerfully grab the opportunity to learn the, the teaching of the Buddha. And they, um, they found, uh, a, a Buddhism found a very fertile ground to establish itself um, in those uh, different lands. And then, um, according to this, as for the uh, amazing capacity to uh, adjust and adapt to different conditions with those unique teachings, uh, Buddhism could survive as very much a part of, uh, integral part of those uh, cultures, local cultures and languages. Uh, in different countries. So it's really very interesting. So we know what happened in the first and second council. Um, like the first, uh, first council, for example, was summoned after three months uh, of the passing away of the Buddha under the uh, chairmanship, under the, uh, the leadership of Venerable Maha Kasapa and there were 500 uh, monks attended. And then uh, at the time of the second council, 
which was held at Vaisali about 100 years after the Buddha, invitations were sent to communities in distinct places like Pathe, Avanti, Kaushambi, Sankase, and Kanoj. Mathura had become an important center of Buddhism in the early uh, years. Um, and very interestingly, um, during the during the King uh, Ashoka's period, um, we see Buddhism flourish in a very uh, unique uh, fashion. And King Ashoka sent uh, missionary groups to many different parts of the world. Uh, including his own uh, son and daughter to Sri Lanka. And so we find those countries, in fact, uh, grab this opportunity uh, and then they could uh, learn Buddhism um, much more and they found it was very helpful and very handy uh, with that uh, powerful very modern kind of teaching. This happened um, after the Third Buddhist Council. And um, King Ashoka also had the blessing of uh, Venerable Mughali Buddha Thissa, uh, the, the chairperson of this Third Buddhist Council. And uh, with the help of uh, Venerable uh, Mughali Buddha Thissa, uh, King Ashoka learned more about Buddhism and then also he used those uh, Buddhist teachings to spread the message uh, everywhere in uh, India. He used the uh, rock edit, he used uh, inscriptions and pillars to, to reach out to the public with the, with the message of the Buddha. And he actually adjust uh, the teaching of the Buddha uh, in order to smoothly govern a very vast territory uh, of his kingdom. And we can also see um, King, uh, not only King Ashoka, King Menander, again, another very uh, important king he also was very instrumental in promoting uh, Buddhism, uh, although not necessarily the same uh, Buddhist tradition, but uh, King Menander's support to Buddhism also was very helpful. Um, And then uh, we, we see King Menander was uh, a Greek king. And then um, Venerable Mughali Putasitisa, it is said he uh, went to uh, that country. Also found uh, uh, Venerable Dharma Rakshita as a wonderful person to reach out to them and then uh, there were, um, because of this um, unique uh, spread of Buddhism to different parts of the globe, um, and uh, also with the lack of transportation, enough transportation, and uh, also lack of communication, uh, then the cultural and languages, languages diversity of those different geographical parts uh, so many uh, Buddhist schools uh, started to begin uh, arise uh, because they did not have any communication uh, communication network, and uh, it's the geographical differences mainly, uh, and no coordinating organization, and then because of that, in due course of time, there were minor differences. And uh, this is also a reason why um, Buddhism uh, actually um, 
some certain Buddhist schools uh, disappeared and some other uh, Buddhist schools uh, in fact merged together with the others. Um, and then uh, we also see uh, out of the many uh, different schools, Mahasangika uh, School of Buddhism was a very important uh, one. Uh, the rapid expansion of Buddhism during Ashoka's time to various parts of India resulted uh, in the rise, uh, the rise of um, Buddhist school sects uh, like uh, up to 18. The origin of these sects was not due so much a doctrine, uh, to doctrinal differences as I mentioned before. Uh, it's mainly uh, because of the geographical factor. Um, and also uh, there was no coordinating organization uh, and many other reasons as I mentioned here also was instrumental in having those uh, different schools. And the Mahasangika during the second century after the Buddha's passing away gave rise to eight different schools. And those eight different schools also include, uh, among them were very famous schools were uh, Eka Vyavaharika, the Lokotravada, the Upper Shaila and the uh, Uttara Shaila. These are the, these were the prominent uh, Buddhist schools um, that were divided uh, in the Mahasangika uh, tradition. And then again, uh, the division started in the Staviravada or Theravada camp a century later. Uh, the first uh, schism or the division gave rise to two schools, the Staviravada and the Mula Staviravada. It's uh, actually Mula Staviravada, okay. So Staviravada and Mula Staviravada, not the Sarvastivada as I mentioned here. It's a, uh, type typo. So this was also called Mulastaviravada, also was called uh, Haimavata. And since its uh, inception in uh, Vaishali, um, Mahasangika was mostly confined to the east from where it spread, uh, especially to the south. The followers of this school probably did not constitute a strong community in the north, as they are mentioned only in two inscriptions. The Mahasangika developed a literature of its own. And uh, so that's another very uh, important contribution of Mahasangika. They had their own uh, Buddhist literature and claimed to have preserved the most authentic tradition of early Buddhism insofar as it traced its lineage from Mahakasapa, Venerable Mahakasapa, the, the chairperson. Most important Buddhist leader, leader after the Buddha and uh, who was responsible for uh, convening the first uh, Buddhist council at which the canon was recited for the first time uh, along with 500 uh, Buddhist monks. Uh, the existence of practically all the branches of the Mahasangika mentioned in literature in the region of Dhanya Kataka. And that shows it had become the most important stronghold of the Mahasangika under the patronage of Satavahana. Okay, and they are successors in the Krishna Valley. Uh, these schools continued to prosper till the third or fourth century AD. And the schools arising from the other camp, uh, that is the, the Taviravada, 
um, or Theravada for the matter. Staviravada is the Sanskrit word and Theravada is the Pali word. Uh, they have also left their definite mark in literature and epigraphy from the Sunga period right up to the Kushana period. And may be said to have flourished from 200 BC to 200 AC, uh, 280, so which is like a 400 uh, uh, years long period. The Sarvastivada and its uh, tradition flourished uh, also during this time and its branches uh, flourished mostly in the north. And the Sarvastivada school was held in esteem in the entire region from Mathura to Nagarhara and from Taksasila to Kashmir. And again, another very important uh, uh, patron of uh, Buddhist uh, history is uh, King Kanishka. So Ka Kanishka's re reign is also a landmark in the history of Buddhism. And he uh, is represented as a great patron of, the, of the Buddhism. Uh, and also he associated himself with the galaxy of Buddhist masters. Um, very, very important. He had a lot of, uh, um, lot of Buddhist master who shaped Buddhism in later times. It was in this period that the Indo-Greek uh, school of Bodhisattva achieved its greatest development. And Buddhist monks from India carried uh, Buddhism to Central Asia and uh, Central Asia and also uh, to China. And then a new form of Buddhism called Mahayana or Mahayana or the greater vehicle uh, of uh, far reaching consequence uh, also came to be evolved at the same time. That's a, a very uh, special uh, thing here. Buddhist monks from India, they carried Buddhism to Central Asia and China, and then uh, Mahayana started, and Mahayana actually uh, developed uh, so much and spread it to many different countries uh, in the East in particular, and also to the West. And so Kanishka's contribution is a very important landmark again in the history of Buddhism. And then uh, when we talk about the Gupta period, uh, during that uh, Gupta dynasty, um, Buddha, uh, Buddhism received a new impetus. Although the Gupta emperors were Bhagavatas, they were not, uh, in fact, uh, Buddhist, they were uh, followers of Brahmanical faith, and yet they were very sympathetic towards the course of Buddhism, and they were very supportive uh, to propagate uh, Buddhism um, because of its um, peaceful uh, nature, and the teaching of the, the Buddha was always involved in uh, Because of that, uh, uh, we have a number of um, important uh, inscriptions uh, during that time. And also, we have um, many different uh, private donors uh, in the re uh, regions of uh, Kaushambi, Sanchi, Bodhgaya, and Mathura. And from the very beginning uh, till the sixth century uh, AD, uh, we had a lot of private uh, donors. And also there are large, uh, uh, large number of um, records written by the Chinese pilgrims especially the Chinese monks who came 
from China to India through Silk Road and very, very unique in the history of uh, Buddhist literature. When we talk about the Chinese pilgrims, the most important thing is that they recorded, uh, their, their travel records were very valid documents uh, because they, they reported uh, all what they saw in different countries. Like when they came to India, they were recording about those uh, Indian temples and also um, different cultural activities. And uh, those very high uh, academic uh, systems. And so many things happen, especially uh, the Buddhist uh, Buddhist art in Mathura, Sarnath, uh, Nalanda, Ajanta, Bhag, and Dhani Kataka. They speak uh, um, they speak um, eloquently uh, about the prosperity of uh, Buddhism uh, that enjoyed during the uh, Gupta period, uh, especially uh, Venerable Fahian. Uh, who came to India during the reign of Chandragupta II testifies to the flourishing condition of Buddhism. Um, Buddhism, in uh, particular in uh, these areas such as uh, such as uh, yeah, Uddiyana, uh, Gandhara, and in Kanoj and Kosala and Magadha and Tamra Lipti. And the foundation of the institutions at Nalanda was also uh, due to this uh, Gupta King uh, patronage. Um, and then again in the, from the middle of seventh century AD, we have a number of records uh, giving a clear picture of the conditions uh, of uh, Buddhism in India. Um, uh, it was flourishing uh, due to uh, many reasons, uh, but uh, they were also having some symptoms of decay. So, however, some of the great centers of Buddhist study like uh, Nalanda and uh, Wallabi, they were still uh, keeping the light uh, uh, very uh, burning very vigorously. King Harshavardhana, for example, he was uh, he was a uh, uh, very important person. Um, he was a follower of Mahayana Buddhism. Um, in the West, the rulers of the uh, Maitraka dynasty at Wallabhi um, became uh, um, he became a very important person and uh, especially uh, Buddhism in that area uh, up to 10th uh, century AD, uh, it was flourishing uh, very well. Uh, the after the Harsha's rule, after around hundred years, uh, there was a kind of anarchic uh, state. Uh, so this also is very much uh, like the teaching of the Buddha, the impermanence. Uh, Every time there is a successful ruler um, or prosperous situation in a country and um, it is followed by some disaster, maybe anarchic situation and uh, also uh, dark areas. It, it's naturally a part of the, the natural law, the nature. So Buddhism talks about this impermanent nature or what we call anicca or anitya. Um, however, while Buddhism was slowly disappearing from some parts of India, um, 
it was also greatly revived in the Eastern India, um, thanks to the patronage of Pala dynasty. So most of the rulers of this dynasty were devout uh, Buddhists, and they were responsible for new endowment uh, to the Nalanda monastery and also for the foundation of new uh, monasteries such as uh, Vikramashila, uh, Odantapuri and Somapuri. They are also very important new um, Buddhist uh, schools. They were in fact like um, those ancient university um, style. They were much more advanced very highly equipped and uh, with uh, very high, uh, highly qualified uh, faculty, like those monks who are very, very high uh, educated monks. Uh, there is a story, in fact, I would like to share with you. Uh, once um, Venerable, um, Venerable Aso Gosa uh, went to Nalanda University and those universities did not accept uh, any student uh, without uh, interview. So when Venerable Asugosa went to um, this university, uh, somebody at the reception, uh, that person came with a bowl full of water and they did not say a word, hello, how are you, good morning, no greeting, nothing. Actually, they were, uh, they were very uh, smart. They were, uh, this uh, interview board, they uh, sent a bowl of water uh, through this receptionist and Venerable Aswagosa uh, was looking at it. They didn't say a word. And then Venerable Aswagosa took a needle from his um, um, eight requisites and he put in uh, to the bowl, uh, which um, sank through the water, pierced through the water and placed safely at the bottom. So it read uh, very, um, uh, at the towards the very um, very bottom of this water, uh, without any hindrance, the needle could uh, pierce through, and so the the receptionist he took the the water bowl to the interview board, and then interview board was very impressed. So what was symbolically discussing here? Um, when the Thero came, uh, the monk came to the university, Nalanda, and the, those um, authorities, they said, this is uh, not a simple place. This is like an ocean of knowledge. You know, it's not easy to study here. And Venerable Asugosa wanted to say, I can pierce through this um, deep fathom of uh, water of knowledge and I can go to the very bottom of this knowledge and that's why he took out needle and put it on the water bowl and which uh, also very easily uh, read to the the bottom the very fathom of the water bowl that impressed the the uh, interview board and they accepted him. It is said. So interesting stories like that are there uh, about these uh, beautiful universities. So, and uh, thus it may be concluded that although some of the old centers of uh, study had fallen into neglect before the rise of the Guptas, um, new and more vigorous centers also came into existence under them. These new centers uh, were numerous, but during the early Gupta period, Kashmir was the most predominant center of uh, Buddhist 
studies. Later, after the foundation of Nalanda, the center of study gradually shifted to Eastern India. And then Nalanda dominated um, from six to nine centuries, uh, nearly three, uh, three centuries. Uh, Nalanda dominated the whole Buddhist world, the entire Buddhist world. It was very famous. It is said um, it's in certain um, historical documents that Nalanda University was destroyed by the invading um, Muslim kings and then the library itself was burning for months and such a rich um, library was uh, destroyed in the 12th century uh, by those um, incoming um, Muslim uh, kings. And in spite of the patronage of the great parlor rulers, however, Nalanda was soon eclipsed by two other uh, institutions, that is uh, Vikramapula, Pura, uh, Vikramashila and Odantapuri. And they were uh, founded under the Pala rulers. So during this uh, Pala dynasty, Buddhism also flourished, uh, especially in the Eastern uh, part. And then there were other uh, institute to other university type uh, education institute such as uh, Jagadala and uh, Vikramapuri, uh, etc. And they monopolized the commerce in Buddhist culture from the 9th uh, to the 12th centuries AD. And when it comes to the Central Asia and China, uh, it is said, um, actually, um, we don't know exactly which date uh, of the introduction of Buddhism to Central Asia, but uh, it should be, uh, it is uh, more evident that the nomadic tribes like Shakas or Kushan and Kushanas, um, as well as some Indian merchants, uh, they carried the elements of Buddhist uh, Indian culture uh, to different states of Eastern Turkestan, um, uh, even before the Christian era, at least a century before the Christian era. And with that, Buddhism also reached out to those areas. So positive evidence is now available to prove that small Indian colonies had been founded in the southern part of this region, from Khotan up to the Labnor region uh, before the uh, Christian era. Again, the, uh, before the Christian era. So it's quite old when Buddhism reached to uh, Central Asia and China. And uh, they said there are, there have been some Indian dialects similar to that of Northwestern India. And that was the official language in some of these states. So we can imagine, we can assume that Indian uh, influence and Indian colonies were the first to carry uh, Buddhism to this uh, region. Um, and then uh, according to ancient Cortanese uh, traditions, uh, a son of Ashoka named Kustana founded the kingdom 234 years after the, the Buddha. Um, and then uh, it was uh, his grandson, uh, Vijaya Sambhava. Okay, another, it is Vijaya Sambhava. Okay, another very important uh, person. Uh, he introduced Buddhism in Khotan. And then uh, there was a, a Buddhist scholar called Are Vairochana. He came from India and uh, Are Vairochana became king's preceptor. And the first monastery in Khotan was built in uh, 211 uh, 
BC. Uh, the tradition, according to the tradition, an Indian dynasty ruled uh, Khotan for 56 generations, which is a pretty long uh, period. And during this time, Buddhism continued to be the dominant religion uh, of the state. And it is also said that nearly 4,000 uh, establishments, including monasteries, temples, and chapels, uh, were flourishing uh, during this time. Uh, Chinese pilgrims, um, especially Fa Hien, Song Yan, and uh, Yuan Shuang, uh, testified to the flourishing condition of Buddhism in Khotan until about the 8th century AD. So Khotan became a very important place uh, of dissemination of Buddhism uh, to other states uh, in the southern part of uh, the country, such as Nia, Kalmodana or Chechen, uh, Krorina or Lowland, and also to Chokkola, Kashgar. There were four important states in the northern part of Chinese Turkestan, that is Bharuka or Bharukacha, also it is said, Akshu, it's another word, Kucha, uh, Kucha and Agnidesha, Karashah, and Kaochan, Turfan. When I see this word Agni Desha, it looks like Agni means fire, Desha means country. It's fire country. So we remind ourselves of this uh, California fire and also Death Valley. Agni Desha is uh, a very suitable title, uh, translation, uh, corresponding Sanskrit word for uh, Death Valley. Agni Desha, because it's a very strong, uh, fierce um, firewall was there. Agni Desha, interesting word. And then uh, so there were four important states in uh, North uh, Turkestan. Bharuka Akshu, Kucha, Agni Desha, and Kaucha. And uh, Kucha was very important. It was the most powerful uh, state. Um, and uh, Buddhism must have read uh, there in the first century AD. And the Chinese annals of the third century mentioned that uh, nearly 1,000 supers and temples uh, were there in Kucha during this period. So Kucha Buddhist monks or Kuchen Buddhist monks uh, had gone to China uh, in this period and they also did a uh, lot of uh, translation. So translation of Buddhist texts was pretty much a part of those ancient um, Buddhist scholarly monks. They went uh, all the time from India and also um, went to China and translated. And some of the Chinese monks came to India and they learned the Dhamma. They also collected uh, those uh, early Buddhist scriptures. And the most important thing is again, and uh, uh, so those Buddhist monks um, and the archaeological uh, factors, uh, we can uh, we can see the flourishing of Buddhism in the north uh, until eighth century AD. And then eventually uh, Buddhism declined in these states again. Uh, but
in the 11th century AD, uh, we can see again uh, Uyghurs patronize uh, Buddhism. So um, when Buddhism disappeared in some place due to some reason, uh, it appeared again in somewhere else thanks to another uh, patron, another patron or sponsor. So very interesting. Right? China received Buddhism from the nomadic uh, tribes, as I mentioned, of uh, Eastern Pakistan. And uh, towards the end of the first century uh, BC, and uh, within a century, it was officially recognized as a religion worthy of to toleration. Interesting. Yeah, so Buddhism was uh, very popular that way. And during the Han Dynasty, 65 to 220 AD, um, all the number of schools, scholars had come to China. They worked among Chinese and translated the large number of texts into Chinese. And uh, Buddhism had a hard struggle with the indigenous religious system somehow. Uh, especially Confucianism um, and Taoism. They were the uh, more popular local um, traditions that people adopted. And Confucianism actually um, looked down upon Buddhism as a barbarian religion. Um, Somehow, uh, there were some attempts, uh, attempts to transform Confucianism into a religion. But interestingly, Buddhism was uh, way ahead, more advanced, and much developed um, as, a, as a religion in compared to uh, Confucianism. And uh, when it comes to Taoism, it was more firmly established as a religion, but its philosophical background was much weaker than that of Buddhism. Therefore, Buddhism had uh, more advantage uh, uh, as against the, both uh, Confucianism and uh, Taoism. Um, and then uh, Buddhism also uh, was much attracted um, in Chinese uh, community uh, than uh, Confucianism and Taoism, as it uh, possessed a much profounder philosophy than Taoism. Um, so um, the Chinese literature, literati, or educated people themselves started following uh, Buddhism. Uh, especially a very important character here uh, called Mao Tse, and he lived uh, towards the closing years of the Han uh, period. Um, that was uh, 170 to 225 AD. And his treatise, his treatise, um, in which he compared the doctrines of Buddhism with the teachings of Confucius and Lao Tzu and tried to establish the superiority of Buddhism. And his, his uh, writings were instrumental in gradually uh, creating confidence uh, among the uh, educated Chinese about Buddhism. Apart from that, uh, in fact, the, the Indian Buddhists uh, who visited China, they had a very pure life, very, uh, very um, powerful, powerful spiritual leader. And uh, their Chinese disciples also 
uh, followed those uh, strict conduct and uh, Chinese people uh, also started uh, kind of enjoying the presence of uh, Buddhism. And, um, and the other reason is the uh, foreign dynasties uh, in China, they also uh, patterning. They, they, they also had um, foreign, um, foreign dynasties, uh, especially uh, the Wei dynasty, which came to the, uh, the Wei dynasty, which came to the, uh, power in the fourth century AD, and it was, uh, a dynasty, uh, an administration of foreign origin. They also greatly helped Buddhism and they were also responsible for bringing uh, beginning of all the great works of Buddhist art uh, in that country. Very, very uh, important. The first emperor of the, uh, the dynasty uh, made Buddhism a uh, state religion. So we can see that uh, Buddhism had somehow some uh, flourishing uh, ground, fertile ground in uh, the mainland China because of uh, diverse reasons, because of very powerful uh, situation actually. So Buddhism continued to prosper in China until about 11th century AD. And uh, Indian teachers from India also came. They kept uh, burning the torch. And uh, from the fourth century AD, somehow the Chinese monks uh, started going to India. And uh, they also uh, started learning uh, about Buddhism under Indian teachers and then started a very large uh, Buddhist literature translated from Indian sources by Indian and Chinese scholars. It helped Chinese to read Buddhism in translation. And these translations also had great uh, literary value and came to be uh, looked upon as classics into Chinese literature. Um, the influence of Buddhism in China. Very important. Uh, the, some of the teachings like uh, rebirth, uh, causality, that is Paticca Samuppada, depend on origination, and the Buddhist theory of karma and impermanence, like everything is not permanent, everything is subject to change, like anicca, and because of anicca, there is suffering, because of suffering, there is no permanent entity called soul. So, that kind of teachings actually had a very deep influence on Chinese life. Um, very deep uh, uh, religious feeling was there. Um, and a profound faith uh, also inspired the great works of art in China, such as uh, Yung Kang, Hong Min, and Tung Huan. Uh, these are some of the, the places that we find um, very uh, important um, Buddhist contribution uh, along the Silk Road from um, Central, from India to Central Asia through Silk Road. And uh, we will learn more uh, about this in our next uh, lesson and uh, so hopefully um, you can also get back to me if you have any any question and also i would like to mention that uh, 
um, you read this uh, those literature and learn about those important uh, Buddhist root uh, like the Silk Road and very interesting uh, Silk Road and uh, like Professor Lewis Lancaster um, a, a champion of uh, maritime Buddhism uh, in the world today one of my uh, professors uh, and uh, he mentions that uh, Buddhism was actually um, reaching to other parts of the globe uh, more through uh, maritime trade than through uh, land route. Although land route was, must have been also used, but given the condition, uh, the death trap in the, the long range of mountains and very hostile um, conditions, um, weather conditions, um, it would be uh, next to impossible uh, to travel with uh, enough food for survival for a long time. And in comparison to that, uh, traveling in the sea with large ships uh, would be more compatible, more comfortable, and more practical uh, for uh, many merchant so we he also explained and his investigation and his research teams uh, have been working continuously i was also part of uh, one of the projects in sri lanka i was working on dambakola patuna and how uh, buddhism went to sri lanka through dambakola patuna uh, a, a port hub in uh, northern sri lanka so um, Sangamitta, Theri Sangamitta, the daughter of Ashoka, King Ashoka, she came to Sri Lanka through Dambakola Patana, what we call Jambukola Patana, uh, along with the, the sapling of the Bodhi tree. So um, maritime trade also was very instrumental, in fact. So we can say Silk Route was definitely uh, playing a great role uh, but maritime trade also was very, very uh, instrumental for uh, those traders, uh, to those uh, merchants to reach out to different countries. Wherever those merchants um, went, they also did not go only with those um, selling materials. They also went with religion, uh, culture, the language, so many things, in fact. Um, it's a complete package when a trader uh, goes, uh, goes to another uh, country. And so for uh, over the centuries, uh, many thousands and thousands of uh, traders went. They, they experimented, they tried, uh, they costed their life and energy to find new, uh, new routes to reach out to different parts of the globe. Uh, to sell their commodities and um, thanks to them uh, we also have uh, Buddhism and other religions reaching out to many different parts of the uh, world. So with that we conclude today and uh, we will see you next week and uh, we appreciate your valuable feedback to help improve our future lessons. Thank you so much and uh, stay in touch. And this is my email address and phone number. Uh, that's it for today then. See you again in the next week. May all beings be well and happy and healthy. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhi tatta sadhu sadhu sadhu.